Today, we welcome a distinguished guest, theologian John Joy, to answer all your pressing questions on papal infallibility on the 1 Peter 5 podcast. Jesus is King. Welcome to the 1 Peter 5 podcast, Rebuilding Christendom, Restoring Catholic Culture and Tradition. I'm Timothy Flanders, Editor-in-Chief of 1 Peter 5, and I'm joined today by Dr. John Joy. Dr. Joy, it's a pleasure and an honor. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me on. It's great to be here. So if, if you're not familiar with Dr. Joy's work, he is uh, he teaches theology at St. Ambrose Academy in Madison, Wisconsin. In his spare time, he also serves as president of the St. Albert the Great Center for Scholastic Studies and managing editor for the Aquinas Institute. His primary academic interests are in the theology and philosophy of St. Thomas Aquinas, dogmatic theology, and especially questions of infallibility and the magisterium of the church. His dissertation is published as On the Ex Ordinary and Extraordinary Magisterium from Joseph Kloitgen to the Second Vatican Council. And he's also published various articles in Nova et Vetera, Seminary Journal, New Black Fires, Antiphon, and most recently, additional work at 1 Peter 5, for which we are most grateful. And his most recent text has been published by Peter Kwasniewski's press, Os Eusti Press, and that is a printed version of many of the articles that have already appeared at 1 Peter 5. Uh, but if you go to osustipress.com, this is the uh, website. If you want to avoid Amazon, you can purchase it here, or you can purchase it on Amazon. But this is the text uh, from John Joy, Disputed Questions on Papal Infallibility. And uh, so this is, this includes his entire scholastic treatment, as well as a few additional aspects. Uh, few, there's an, a, one article by a guest person as well. You want to tell us anything about this, this newest text as we're, uh, final sh Christmas shopping is still going on. Yeah, uh, like you said, it's a it's a collection of uh, a number of articles that have appeared on One Peter Five, um, but but really it's a little bit the other way around. I mean, it was written as uh, as one uh, one entire work of a uh, of a disputed questions on papal infallibility in the style of Saint Thomas Aquinas's uh, Summa Theologiae. Where uh, in my studies of the Magisterium over the past decade or so, um, it's just a thorny topic, and and I've encountered the same kind of stumbling blocks and arguments and misunderstandings, uh, and it gets technical real fast. Um, and it's easy to get lost in the, um, it's easy to get lost in the technicalities, especially uh, for kind of uh, newcomers to the discussion. Um, and so I, I, I thought that the, the style of St. Thomas Aquinas, where he takes one question at a time, because if you start to discuss the magisterium infallibility, everything you say opens up about six new questions. And so you're never able to, to finish an argument. You know, if you're, if you're discussing one thing, you find yourself um, getting side railed all the time on a lot of interesting and important and connected um, topics. So I wanted to, to take Aquinas's approach of uh, tackling one topic at a time very thoroughly. Uh, so, uh, so it's a collection of two kind of big questions uh, and then, um, you know, almost 20 articles or so in between there. So, so it was written as, a, as one comprehensive work uh, and then it was published kind of piecemeal uh, a little bit in Nova et Vetera uh, and then all of it again in, I forget how many, four or five parts on 1 Peter 5. So this is kind of putting it all back together in, uh, as a whole piece. Uh, with additional essays that I've written on on related topics where I go more in depth on some aspects of the magisterium in a more conventional essay kind of style. And then there's an, uh, an appendix by uh, Dr. Jeremy Holmes, um, uh, whom I know through my work with the Aquinas Institute, where uh, it, it, adds, it adds a perspective that I don't approach um, because my writing is... is polemical, it's disputational. It's kind of here, here's, the, here's the question, here's the proofs, here's the arguments, here's the objections. Uh, Jeremy Holmes in that appendix asks the bigger question about um, why would the church have this kind of diversity of modes of teaching? Why would there be 
infallible sometimes and not infallible other times. So a bit more of a big picture philosophical uh, discussion of, of why things are set up this way, of why it would make sense, why this is fitting that God would institute the church this way. So it provides a very, um, a very helpful kind of uh, additional perspective to, to put the whole thing uh, into perspective, I think. Excellent. Yes, this is one of the best treatments of these issues, and you really need to buy this if you're trying to dig into these 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 difficult questions. It, it really is uh, a fantastic treatment. So thank you, uh, Dr. Joy, for putting it together. Uh, so we're going to get into all these complicated disputations in just a minute. But before we do, I uh, just wanted to let everyone know that uh, happy feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe, of course, the Empress of the Americas. Uh, this week we have a, some holy days of opportunity, namely the Ember Days. And that is uh, fasting on Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday in Thanksgiving for uh, the fall and, and supplication for the winter, supplication for good vocations. This is an opportunity because it's not obligatory anymore to fast, but we encourage you to fast nevertheless. And um, we also have the our series at 1 Peter 5, Hispanidad, which is our series on all glories of Spanish Catholicism. And uh, so check that out. That's linked below. You can also take a look at John Joy's. All of his work at 1 Peter 5 is also linked below. And finally, before we get into our topic, always need to appeal because we're still at our year year end fundraiser right now. And uh, our May fundraiser, we had a spring fundraiser. We did not raise enough money to cover all the costs for 1 Peter 5. So we still are in need of costs. We don't do this every month anymore, but we might need to start doing it every month or, or pestering you more often because we just need to pay our bills. So please give to 1 Peter 5. We're a nonprofit organization. We re rely on your donations to pay all of our bills. Go to 1peter5.com slash donate. So the topic... Disputed questions on papal infallibility. I want to first talk more generally about the state of Catholic theology today, um, because there seems to be quite a disconnect to me, uh, Dr. Joy, between there's a lot of people who are talking heads, you know, online, on YouTube or blogs or whatever, saying things that Catholic theology says this or Catholic doctrine says this. Um, and then there's the academic world which is where people are being published, they're PhDs, they're in academic institutions. Um, but there, there does seem to be some disconnect. For example, the disputed questions, the fact that these things are disputed questions. Many people on the internet or whatever, people who are maybe famous, are saying, well, this is a settled question. It's, it's completely resolved. This is Catholic doctrine. Like, for example, the Pope can never err whatsoever on, in any of his magisterium that's non-definitive you know, that type of uh, attitude. Um, can you talk at all about the disconnect um, and uh, help the common layman? How do we get through this sort of difficulty of, uh, you know, people saying one thing and um, not knowing that in the academic world, these things are a little bit more complicated? Yeah. Um, let me try to say a couple of things. Um, first of all, uh, I love that illustrated liturgical year image that you just uh, threw up there. We have that on the refrigerator uh, at my house, and we have a little magnet that the kids move along from one day to the next. Oh, that's great. Uh, it's one of the best things I've seen published recently. So buy that before you buy my book. Um, uh, yeah, the disconnect between um, between the academic world and kind of the, the internet world, I suppose. Um, <clears throat> there could be any number of, of reasons for that. So I don't know if I can uh, say everything, but a couple of things that come to mind. One is when you're, when you're in the academic world, um, you have to be a lot more cautious with what you say. Uh, and that's not always true on, on the internet. Um, and that really is a good thing. So, so, uh, Sometimes I'm sure it can be used as a kind of cloak for cowardice that, um, I mean, there's a kind of temptation in academia to never take a clear stand, to always kind of um, waffle and nuance and, um, yeah, just, just 
uh, you can play that game forever. Uh, and that's not a good thing. But, but what is good is a kind of cautiousness um, about not asserting more than you can more than you can prove, more than you can back up. Um, and part of the reason for that, I suppose, is, is just the real world consequences. So if you, if you bite off more than you can chew in an internet argument, the only backlash you get is some angry, some angry tweets or some angry emails or something like that. Uh, and some people seem to just thrive on that. So maybe that's not even a real backlash. Um, but if you're going to publish something in a, in a respectable, if you're going to try to publish something in a respectable a journal or publishing house, or you're going to uh, to give a, a, a talk in a professional capacity, um, and you just say egregiously false things, or, or if you if you really overstep uh, what you can prove, and you're challenged on it, I mean, um, that does something to your reputation. And if you're a professional theologian, you're trying to make your livelihood based on um, uh, based on the reputation that you have. So I don't think that's just uh, vanity or self-serving care, care for ref reputation. I think there's a real professional concern um, to try to be careful and precise and accurate. So that's one uh, piece of the problem, I think. The other is a very, um, it's a very old saying that a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. So uh, I think anybody who's studied any subject deeply has experienced this, that after you're after you know one semester uh, of a college class in a subject, you tend to think you know just about all that there is to know. Uh, and after about you know five, seven years in, a, in graduate studies, you realize at that point that you barely know anything. Uh, so I've, I mean, um, I, let me see. I did, I did ten years of, of uh, graduate and postgraduate studies in theology. Uh, and I've, I've studied and written since, and I've probably never felt more ignorant than I feel now. <laughs> <clears throat> so there is, um, there is really something about uh, the deeper you enter into any subject, the more you see how vast the field is, how complicated some things are, uh, and how little uh, you yourself actually know. Now, having said that, um, I also don't think, I, don't, I also don't think it's really that complicated. So once, once you've really uh, grasp the subject thoroughly, in the end, it's fairly simple. I don't mean simple in the sense of easy. I mean simple in the sense of uh, it, all, it all hangs together and you can see the inner coherence and it no longer seems uh, confusing and difficult once you, once you see through it. Uh, and I think, I think the conversations with the magisterium are especially subject to that problem that, um, well, I have, I have half a suspicion that there are some theologians who try to obfuscate conversations of the magisterium in order to downplay the authority of ecclesiastical teachings that they don't particularly like. So, um, so the uproars, I mean, you know, in the past 50 years, uh, until recently, most of the conversations about the precise limits and modes of teaching the magisterium and all that, all swirled around humani vitae. It was all, um, uh, it, it was humani vitae that made everyone realize how complicated the magisterium is. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think half the complication is planted. In other words, I don't think it's as complicated as it's often assumed to be. I think a lot of the <clears throat> a lot of the conditions and distinctions and nuances uh, are actually made up and kind of thrown into the soup in order to in order to muddle the picture. Mm -hmm. But it does take some work then to kind of, to cut through uh, what is just noise and get down to what is actually essential, what you do need to pay attention to. Uh, that takes some doing, uh, and that's what I hope I've tried to do in these disputed questions: is is cut through a lot of the uh, objections uh, that aren't really relevant um, to concentrate consistently just on the essential points. Yeah, that absolutely. Um, I think that's a wonderful thing that you just said. I definitely relate to that in terms of, you know, when I was a first undergraduate freshman year, I was like, I know everything. And now I'm like, well, I, <laughs> you know, know very little, um, very little I can say with certainty. Um, but what would you say to uh, there? There are tr critics of the trad movement out there who say, oh, you trads, uh, you're dissenters or maybe even your schismatics. 
and and things like this. They they hurl these labels at us. Um, but when I look at, uh, for example, this this text here, which is uh, defending the faith against present heresies, which is a collection of of all of these different scholars and academic theologians who have written some form of critical, even bishops and cardinals, they've written some form of critical uh, text uh, asking the Holy Father to clarify or or say that his words are dubious, at least. Um, and I think of certain mainstream theologians, namely, for example, Aidan Nichols, who's still published to this day in Communio, the international you know, mainstream Orthodox Catholic journal. Um, what would you say to critics who really try to marginalize trads in these critical voices um, who, who want to call us to be schismatic and dissenters because we sign on to certain things like this? Yeah, gosh. Um, so <laughs> uh, maybe one thing, I, I one of my articles uh, on 1 Peter 5 that's in the back of this book is titled that the Pope is not the church and the church is not the Pope. So, so one of the basic errors I think that that is easy to fall into if you're not careful about these things is identifying the Pope personally with the church as such. It's the, <clears throat> it's the old error of the, of the absolutist French monarchy, uh, uh, you know, l'état c'est moi, my French is terrible, but, but Louis XIV was famous for saying, uh, you know, what is the state? I am the state. So this idea of the total identification of the monarch with the community, it's the same error in the church that the, the Pope is certainly the, uh, the supreme head of the church on earth. He's the vicar of Christ uh, and he has the, the fullness of the apostolic authority, et cetera, et cetera. We believe, we believe all the things that the church teaches about the authority of the Pope. But the head of the church doesn't mean that he just simply is the church. The church is actually the whole mystical body of Christ. Um, and so the, you have to be careful about uh, the Pope because uh, sometimes when he speaks uh, with his full authority, then you can say um, the church has spoken through Peter to kind of summarize what the, uh, what the bishops said about Peter has spoken through Leo at the, at the Fourth Ecumenical Council. But when the Pope speaks with the fullness of, of his authority, then yes, we can say the church uh, speaks through him. Um, or, uh, or the church teaches what the Pope teaches. Um, but obviously, if he's on an airplane just giving an interview, then he's just on an airplane giving an interview. And you can say the Pope says this, that, or the other thing. Uh, but it would be absurd to say, therefore, that the church thinks this, that, or the other thing. As if the church was this disembodied consciousness floating around through the centuries, which is constantly changing its opinions with every new pope that's absolute rubbish the pope is is the mystical body of jesus christ uh and the pope is the head of that body but the church is um uh, the church is a much bigger institution than just the pope even though he has a very important role in the church so to give you an, uh, an analogy i mean if you um if you're traveling and you uh, are coming into the united states uh and the and the uh, border agent you know stamps your passport <clears throat> Uh, in that moment, he's acting as a representative of the U.S. government. So you could say, uh, you know, uh, the United States of America let me into the country. Well, that's imprecise, right? Because really it's, it's, it's one agent who let you in. Uh, but he was acting as a representative in that moment of the United States of America. So you can make that, you can make that transition and say, yeah, okay, the U.S. let me in. But if he stamped your passport upside down, right? So, this, so the stamp is, is the wrong way around in your passport. You're never gonna say the United States of America uh, stamped my passport upside down. You're always gonna attribute that immediately just to the personal agent because in that moment, the way he holds the stamp, he's not acting as the official agent of the United States in that moment. That, that's a personal, a personal mistake he made. Uh, think of the president of the United States as well. I mean, we all know the difference between an executive order and a tweet. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so when, when the president signs an executive order, you can say, well, you know, this is what the government uh, has said we need to do. You can, you can, you can equate the president uh, and the government. Um, but when the president tweets something, nobody runs around thinking like the government has said we have to do X, Y, or Z just because the president put it out on Twitter. Uh, 
So, so we make this distinction habitually in every other uh, sphere of life, but for some reason, uh, we don't very easily do it with the Pope, and we should. So we need to both be able to say, yes, he holds the supreme office in the church. Yes, he is the visible head of the church on earth. Uh, yes, he's not subject to the judgment of any other uh, body on earth, et cetera, et cetera. All of the papal dogmas, we love them. It's why we're Catholic. I mean, we, we love the dogmas of the papacy uh, as well as all the rest of the Catholic dogmas. Um, but you still have to be able to tell when the Pope is um, speaking uh, in persona ecclesiae, so to speak, in the person of the church versus when he's just voicing his private opinion. I've lost track now by now of the question. No, yeah, that, that, this is this is all really great, which brings up uh, a further clarification about that third proposition of the Professio Fidei, where you talk about religious, it's religious, religious submission of mind and will to the Roman pontiff and the College of Bishops. Uh, and I think that people get really scrupulous about this. because, And I want to bring up your other essay, which is also fantastic on this question. Submission to the non-infallible ma papal magisterium is conditional. And this is where you kind of break down religious submission of mind and will. Um, though I, I just had somebody ask me this question on an email. And uh, you know who you are. And he was he was tempted to Eastern Orthodoxy. And I was trying to explain to him how it's it is sort of a it is somewhat simple in the sense if i'm not a theologian which i'm not i'm just a layman i'm teaching my children the faith uh and what i said to him tell me what you think of this um and those analogies by the way are very helpful thank you um i just said to him uh you follow everything the pope and bishops say you just do what they say unless they do or say something that seems to you to be against the faith itself then you you don't follow that. You follow the faith and you would ask them to clarify. What do you mean by that? That doesn't seem to jive with what I'm teaching my five-year-old in his catechism. That doesn't make any sense. So I'll just follow the catechism and ask them to clarify. So what do you think about that as an approach to the third proposition of the Professio Fidei? Yeah, I think that's good. I mean, the, the tricky part about that is um, how can you tell if how can you tell that the catechism is going to be more of a sure guide than the Pope? Because the catechism comes at you on the authority of the Pope. So there's a little bit of a difficulty there, right? So, so I don't think you can simply pick up one book like the catechism. Because uh, <clears throat> the catechism is a mixture of infallible teachings. <clears throat> it represents a lot of the dogmatic infallible teachings of the church, the essence of the faith. Uh, from all the centuries, but then it's also got mixed into it, the modern catechism we're talking about, it's got mixed into it some of that third paragraph stuff, some of that stuff that just requires the religious submission of will and intellect. So the, the catechism is, is uh, useful, it's handy to have it all in one place, um, but I would say the, the, the only really foolproof way to do that is to is to always say, uh, I will accept whatever is taught by my local bishop, uh, who we know is not infallible ever, and by the Pope and by an ecumenical council or whatever, um, when they're not speaking infallibly, only to the extent, like you said, until it seems to conflict with something uh, that really belongs to the faith. But then I'm gonna have to ask myself, <clears throat> Well, how do I know it conflicts with the faith? And then you really have to, you have to go to a higher authority. Um, so in the church, what's the hierarchy of authority, dogmatically speaking? Uh, first and foremost, it's divine revelation. Uh, and that has uh, two streams, sacred scripture and tradition. So everything in scripture, everything in tradition, divinely revealed, dogma, guaranteed by God, no questions asked. Then you have uh, the infallible magisterium. So, so we're tempted too often to think, well, then you, we associate with the magisterium with particular people. We'll think of like, well, what comes next, the Pope or the ecumenical council? That's a bad way of phrasing the question. There were, there were disputes about this in the Middle Ages. You can't put the ecumenical council's authority above the Pope. Um, 
but the ecumenical council, which includes the Pope, has equal authority to the Pope. None of that really matters. What matters is, I'm sorry, it does matter in its own context. It, it's not relevant to this question. Um, the infallible teaching of the magisterium <clears throat> comes next. And the infallible teaching of the magisterium presents to us the contents of scripture and tradition uh, in a dogmatic form or in a, or in a irreformable doctrinal form. We don't worry about that nuance. And then you have the non-infallible magisterium as a step down. So if it's in scripture, if it's in tradition, or if it's taught by the infallible magisterium, it's non-negotiable. And we have ways of knowing what's in those things other than just listening to the most recent papal interview or reading the most recent papal document. You're not dependent on your knowledge of the sources of faith on just whatever the current Pope happens to be saying. Uh, so then the, the lowest category then is the uh, non-infallible but still authoritative teaching of popes and bishops on faith and morals. And that's that area, that's that third paragraph that you just highlighted on the screen where we ought to accept and agree with, with everything that's taught there unless it contradicts something that, that we hold on higher authority. And so when you say, I hold it on higher authority than the Pope, I don't mean that there is in the church somebody above the Pope. It's not appealing to another office. <clears throat> it's appealing to a more authoritative form of teaching, uh, which has come to us either from previous Popes or from ecumenical councils approved by popes. I mean, so the authority of the pope is all wrapped up into it. Um, but that's a really key point to see. We don't appeal from the teaching of a pope to some form of higher position. We appeal from when necessary. And this doesn't happen very often. But in the hypothetical case that a pope were to teach something contrary to faith in his non-infallible magisterium, uh, you appeal to the more authoritative teaching of the Pope as an office. So you, you gotta move up that ladder, <clears throat> um, but, it's a, but it's a doctrinal ladder. It's like a ladder of doctrinal certitude. It's not a, it's not a ladder of hierarchical offices. Yes, I, I think that, that that's really helpful. And I, I, I wanna just bring up a real life example of this. Uh, to 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 give an example of doing what you're what you just described, and I should have been more precise when I just said the catechism. I just meant um, your basic first communion catechism, whether that's orally given or through Baltimore th number two or or whatever it is. Because what I mean by this, I think this is a really good example, is the most recent document of critical of a critical nature against in some sense, the Holy Father, which is actually not contained in this text because it's 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 um, more recent than that. And that is this text for um, about Desiderio Desideravi, which cites, as you say, it is a more it, it, it contrasts Desiderio Desideravi, which is basically just this apostolic letter, um, which is a, a just essentially a reflection. It's there's sort of the spiritual reflection not meant to be any sort of definitive act of the Roman pontiff. So it's of a lower, lower authority than what is contrasted with this canon from the Council of Trent, which says this, if anyone says that faith alone is sufficient preparation for receiving the sacrament of the Most Holy Eucharist, let him be anathema. So this is a dogmatic anathema. And it's not only a dogmatic anathema. What I mean by this is this is something that we teach to first communicants. So, you know, this is, a, this is what a seven-year-old should understand, i.e., if you have mortal sin, you have to go to confession before you receive the Blessed Sacrament. This is the, one of the most basic teachings uh, of, you know, because this is another uh, thing that uh, critics of the trads will say, will say, oh, you're using your private judgment to judge the Pope. No, we're not, you know, we should, and that's correct. We shouldn't use our private judgment to judge the Pope. That's correct. I, you know, concede the point. But what this is, for example, what this is doing is saying, this is something that the church has publicly declared to be publicly definitively taught by the church. And so therefore we teach that to seven-year-olds to understand. And this teaching of the Holy Father, which is non-definitive and non-authoritative in, in over that, seems to at least suggest that the contrary is true. So therefore we say we must hold to the dogmas of Trent over 
a spiritual reflection of the Holy Father, even though it's from the Holy See. Yeah, and partner. you can certainly you can suspend judgment on on what the Holy Father said. I mean, you can you can uh, you can take the approach that says, look, uh, Trent's teaching there is very clear and it's dogmatic. So there's there's no scenario under which you're permitted uh, to deny that dogma. Now, does what Pope Francis said uh, contradict it? You don't have to take a position on that, right? <clears throat> you can, I mean, uh, you're fully within your rights to use your own intelligence and, and form an opinion, but you should be cautious and respectful about doing so. You should certainly be respectful and cautious about expressing uh, uh, open criticism of the Holy Father, although it's although it can be done respectfully. Um, but, you know, you, in, in order to be a good Catholic father and layman, uh, you don't have to take position on all those things. The one thing you can't do is say, well, Pope Francis has contradicted Trent, and so Trent no longer applies. Right? Because if there is a conflict, then uh, the higher authority takes precedence. And that doesn't mean that the ecumenical council is a higher authority than the Pope. It means that the dogmatic teaching of the church, whether from Pope or council, is a higher authority than the merely authoritative teaching of either a Pope or a council. And that, that's, that's really helpful. Um, and because there's basically one of two options here, you either it is contradictory and then therefore we must follow Trent or it reconciles and, and Pope Francis is actually not contradicting Trent. He, he means it in a different sense. And that's also an acceptable position to take. And as you said, it doesn't really matter which position you take if you're just a layman, you know, father catechizing your first communicant here. Um, so, and that brings up uh, going further into your disputed questions on papal infallibility, because you you mention uh, sort of a mean between two extremes. On the one hand, there's sort of the liberal extreme, which uh, appears, I, I don't know if this is true or not, but it appears that after Humanae Vitae, liberals in the church started saying papal infallibility has only been used twice. And this is this is a myth that's still repeated. I, I saw it published in a major publisher recently. Uh, this is a myth that that's spread everywhere. Whereas, as you show in your articles, prominent theologians before Humanae Vitae, I, I'm not aware of any that said there was only twice. Uh, they all were had lists of six to twelve to more uh, art lists of of infallible statements. And then on on the other extreme, the other extreme of this is that. Basically, everything the Pope says is infallible. Uh, Non-definitive uh, Pope, you know, plain, plain uh, comments, tweets, everything's infallible, basically. Um, so, and and that that was the the subject of this, which um, was uh, where we tried to break down these sort of different schools of thought following Vatican I. Um, there's sort of this spectrum. Uh, all the way from hyper papalist, papal maximalist, papal minimalist, all the way to what I what I termed a neo Jansenist position, which is which is where we do have, and I, I think we can concede that some trads do go into this category, which is just kind of like this really negative attitude towards the hierarchy all the time. It's always, you know, we're just going to reject everything, sort of knee jerk reaction. That's not a pious attitude. It's not having submission of mind and will. That's not allowed. Um, but uh, can you speak at all to sort of the spectrum um, and where you see that there should be this sort of mean between these extremes? Yeah, this is a, this is an interesting one because depending on how you work out these terms, uh, I could very easily, I mean, anybody who reads my book could very easily accuse me of being a minimalist or a maximalist, kind of depending on, uh, depending on which view you're reading it from, I suppose. Um, so I, I try to walk a middle road, certainly, um, but it's not so much a middle road of saying, you know, um, it's, it's not a quantitatively middle. It's not, some people say there are only two, some people say there's um, a thousand, so I'm just gonna go for, you know, the middle of 501 or something like that. Um, I think a reason for that, a big reason for that discrepancy between the minimalists and the maximalists the ones who don't recognize infallibility very often at all, and those who see it everywhere, 
Um, one of the most curious things about that phenomenon is I don't think it really breaks cleanly between the kind of uh, progressive and traditional or conservative or liberal camps in the church. I, people seem to stray back and forth easily between those two extremes. Even one person uh, in one conversation will be saying, so for example, a very kind of piously intentioned apologetic um, apologetic amateur, right? Somebody who um, just wants to uh, convert the Protestants, bring them into the church, piously motivated, uh, can be easily tempted to downplay the difficulty of what are perceived to be stumbling blocks uh, to a Protestant. And so you're going to hear in that context, well, it's only ever happened twice. Uh, you know, we do technically believe it, but you don't have to worry about it. It's not going to affect your life too much. There is kind of that downplaying of it, which comes from, I think, a desire to lower obstacles to reunion with the church. Then there's the other very different kind of motivation of uh, downplaying the number in order to avoid having to give assent to, to some teachings you don't agree with, like maybe happened with Humanae Vitae. Um, but it is, <laughs> it is oddly, in many cases, the same people who will turn around and criticize you if you question anything that any pope has ever said with any level of authority at all. So they, there's a kind of knee-jerk uh, reaction towards this maximalism. And I think one of the reasons for that is simply the lack of clarity about the boundaries. Okay, so the hyper-papalist that you have on the screen there, uh, of the three you've got listed there, that, that really is the extreme. Um, tolerated opinion to me feels a little bit generous. I suppose it's accurate because this opinion has never been um, condemned by the church, so it's tolerated in an official sense. Um, but that's the best that can be said for it because there's no uh, there's no substantial arguments in support of it that can really hold up. Um, so that that view just uh, doesn't even recognize a distinction between the infallible and the non-infallible teaching of the magisterium. Most people, in my experience, they recognize that there is such a distinction. I mean, the, 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 um, <laughs> the slam dunk proof of that is that uh, John Paul II taught that there is such a distinction. So if you want to be a papal maximalist and hold to everything that any pope, he did this in a Wednesday audience, it's very low level authority, um, but he makes that distinction. And if you, so if you want to defend everything that every Pope has ever said in any degree of authority as necessarily being free of error, then you'd have to admit that John Paul teaching there is also free of error. So you'd have to admit that there is a distinction between an infallible and a non-infallible. So um, that's enough about the hyper-papalist. I don't think there's much to be said uh, about that one. It's tolerated, but that's not saying much. The other two, um, both recognize the maximalist and minimalist, both recognize that there is a distinction between the infallible and the non-infallible, but they don't know where the line is. So, so what do you do psychologically when you know there's like an important chasm and you're not sure where it is? You tend to stay as far away from it as you can. <clears throat> so if anybody is... Um, <laughs> If anybody is asserting a strong view of papal authority, you'll shy away and say, well, only twice, right? Um, because you don't know where that line is, so you want to stay clear of it. Um, but if anybody is uh, critiquing actual papal teaching, uh, you'll criticize that too. So I think, I think it's a lack of clarity about where the line is. G.K. Chesterton has this metaphor about fences and freedom. that he says, if you put a fence around children, even on the top of a cliff. They'll, they'll run and play very freely and happily, uh, even right to the boundaries of the fence, because the fence shows them where the line is, it protects them, uh, they know where they are, they feel safe, they're confident. Whereas if you take the fence away, they'll all just huddle in the middle and not go anywhere near uh, the edges. There's something like that going on, where if you don't have a clear understanding of where the line is, uh, you tend to stray um, pretty wide of it on both ends, depending on the context of any given conversation. So the mean that I try to walk between those is not splitting the difference between them necessarily. 
It's just trying to get clarity on where that line is. And if we can have clarity about what the difference is and how to recognize it, and really, uh, it's not so complicated. You don't have to, uh, you don't have to read Latin. You don't have to master uh, hundreds of books. You don't need advanced degrees. Um, if you can, if you can see the line, then you can walk right up to it on one side uh, and without crossing over, and you can walk right up to it from the other side without crossing over. So. Uh, you can you can confidently defend the infallibility <clears throat> of dozens of papal documents, uh, and there are many grand and glorious ones which are are worthy of defending, um, without without stepping over the line in that direction. And then you can also very comfortably uh, admit that yeah, in the lower level teaching, there could be actual uh, errors, there could be actual heresies. Uh, because you know you're on that side of the line. Uh, I think that's that's very that's a great way to say it, and we need to unpack that definitely for the lay faithful. I we really want to use this broadcast to try to equip people with some of the basics so that we can have that fence. Um, one question from the chat is: Is there any agreement on a, sort of a list of infallible statements? And it does seem to me, um, Doctor Joy. It, are there any sort of mainstream authoritative theologians who said there were only two infallible statements before Humanae Vitae? Because none of the authors that you cite that I saw ever claimed that there were two if they were no. before Humanae Vitae. The, the earliest source that I have yet found for that claim is a joint statement of Luther. It's like one of these um, Lutheran, Roman, Catholic dialogue joint statements. Oh, right. Documents. Yeah, you cite that's from uh, like the 80s from, or From the 90s. 70s, I think. Oh, okay. I've, I've never seen it any earlier than that. Um, but it may have been around in some in some fashion. Um, but none of, the, none of the theologians who were writing on ecclesiology um, in the 19th or 20th century you know, prior to that, uh, we're saying any such thing as far as I've seen. So that is, uh, that is, I think, quite an, a novel idea. <clears throat> um, yeah, my suspicion, again, is that it's, it's, it's just motivated uh, and doesn't really have a basis. I mean, the, the, the joint statement of that dialogue committee where I found it in the 70s, I mean, their, their reasoning is that uh, they say that it's only a teaching is only infallible if it itself explicitly claims to be so. So in other words, the Pope would have to say, I infallibly declare X, Y, or Z. Um, but, but even the two commonly cited dogmas of the Immaculate Conception and the Assumption don't meet that criteria. So really on their own criteria, there would be zero in that scenario. <clears throat> right. Yeah, so I want to get into what are the actual marks of infallibility in just a minute. But before I do, I wanted to just touch on the theological notes, because this is something for me as a non-theologian has really helped me, is the fact that um, in this so in this article, we have, as you said, tolerated opinion. And then number two is called a pious opinion. And number three is called a probable opinion. And probable merely means... In, in English, it, it doesn't mean the same thing in English. It's basically, it simply means that there are, there are author, uh, authorities or arguments in its favor. Um, and yes, a pious opinion one. is a little, little bit less than that. But theological notes, as far as I understand them, are, are basically the ways that theologians have categorized different aspects of doctrine, which have not yet been definitively clarified by the magisterium, into different degrees of certainty and thus degrees of binding character so some all the way down to a tolerated opinion which is the church tolerates it it you know you can believe it if you want to um so you there's nothing wrong with that but um there are more probable opinions so i think the difficulty is on the one hand we're not saying that truth is relative we're not saying that it doesn't matter what you believe the the with the theological notes the theologians are simply saying some of these opinions have more weight than others in terms of the authority of the magisterium. Um, and I think that that really helps me because a lot of people in the online universe, they want to excommunicate each other based on these, these different things that have not been clarified. As you say, they're disputed questions. Like these are something that the theologians can dispute about how much more can the common lay people who are not theologians. So 
any uh, comments about the theological notes? Yes. Yeah, they, they, they have fallen out of use to a large extent in theology, which is a pity uh, because they did serve and could still serve to bring a lot of clarity to this kind of thing. I would say that the, <clears throat> um, the use, so these developed amongst theologians. These, these are like a, a, a scientific notation. I mean, every, every field of science will have its own kind of um, classification rules and things like that. So these don't come first and foremost uh, from the official teaching of the church. Although uh, in the late Middle Ages and early, into the early modern period, these notes were used in a good number of documents of the church. So they're kind of taken up to some extent, but still kept their broad scientific character. So they can be a little confusing. What The main point I'd want to say is um, there's, a, there's a short, simple version of just three essential notes that really every Catholic uh, can and should know. Just those three. And they're summarized at the end of the current profession of faith that the CDF published in uh, 88 and 98. You put them up on the screen a little bit earlier. Those three are the essentials. And those three are dogma. You've got to know what a dogma is, which has to be believed with the theological virtue of faith. I mean, that's the Catholic faith or the dogmas. And then the second one are the doctrines of the church. <clears throat> yeah, that second short paragraph. Uh, doctrines of the church uh, regarding faith and morals that have been definitively proposed. That means infallibly. So uh, number one, you've got infallible dogmas. That means revealed directly by God and infallibly taught by the church. Uh, you have to believe those uh, unhesitatingly, absolutely firmly on the basis of God's own authority. So that's the virtue of faith. Of so the, so faith. just just an example of this. So the, a dogma of this would be the dogma of the real presence. Absolutely. Right. right. Okay. Yeah. So uh, anything contained in any of the creeds uh, is going to be a dogma. Uh, anything contained in scripture or tradition. It's a very wide category because uh, the, the fact that the apostle Paul went to Rome is a dogma because it's because it's explicitly in scripture. OK. And scripture is divinely revealed and proposed uh, infallibly to us by the church as the inspired and divinely revealed word of God. Um, so you don't typically think of those kinds of things as dogmas, but they are. Um, but, uh, but certainly the, uh, the creeds, um, uh, the, the, the infallible <clears throat> definitions of uh, dogmas like the Immaculate Conception, the Assumption, those ones people think about are, are all in this category. The second category is still infallible, still non-negotiable. There's really just a technical difference that, that won't affect most people's daily life. Well, it could if you, if you decide to reject one of these. Um, these are called doctrines, not dogmas. Uh, they're still infallibly taught by the church, and Catholics are still absolutely obliged to accept and hold them as true. Uh, no questions asked, no exceptions. The difference is that uh, these are not directly revealed by God, um, but connected somehow to divine revelation by a logical or historical connection where denying them would undermine the deposit of faith, divine revelation in some significant way. So just to give you an example, if you, uh, if you denied that Pius IX was a legitimate pope, you would undermine you would undermine to a significant degree the dogma of the Immaculate Conception, which he defined, right? But uh, that Mary was conceived without sin is revealed by God. That's why we believe it as a dogma. That Pius IX was validly uh, legitimate uh, pope is not revealed by God. That's not part of scripture or tradition. Uh, public revelation ceased with the death of the last apostle. There's nothing about Pius IX. Uh, that was said back then. So uh, let, let me ask this. Um, so the dogma, the real presence is a dogma, but then would a doctrine be like transubstantiation or the distinction between substance and accidents as a corollary to that? Would that be a doctrine as opposed to a doc dogma there? Oh, that's, yeah, that's an interesting one. I mean, so sometimes, right, the terminology that we use, uh, Trent says, I'm not going to be able to quote it from memory, uh, 
But there's an anathema against those who say that transubstantiation is not a fitting term or something like that. Okay. Um, so, so in other words, just, just the audience. So the, the, the distinction between substance and accident was not revealed by God. That came from Aristotle. The, the church is simply utilizing that to explain a revealed dogma. So that's why I, I thought of that as right. a doctrine. Yeah, the terminology comes from Aristotle, right? The terminology. Uh, but, the, but the fact of the matter, um, right? right? The, the fact that the Eucharist does, in fact, become in its being uh, the body of Christ, which is what the word substance is driving at there. Um, so, yeah, uh, it can cut pretty close there. Um, in some of these distinctions. And like I say, that's not going to make much difference to many of us very often. It'll make a difference only if you reject one of these teachings, because if you reject a dogma, you're a heretic, which actually puts you outside the church. If you reject a, uh, an infallibly taught doctrine, uh, it's an error, not a heresy. It's still a grave sin. Uh, it certainly harms your... Um, uh, your it it harms your membership in the church. I mean, it's a blow uh -huh. against uh, against communion with the church, but it's not an outright heresy, um, and that could make a difference. I mean, uh, it's it's going to be a serious sin either way. So just go to confession. Yes. <laughs> um, so then the, the the third final third and final note. Uh, the first one is dogma. The second one is doctrine. What would you call number three? Is that just teaching? Yeah, the, so the terminology is not real precise. So you have, to, um, you have to call the middle one definitive doctrine or infallible doctrine. And the third one is usually called um, merely authentic doctrine. So they're, okay. they're both doctrine. And we often speak loosely about these things, which adds to confusion. But if you wanted to be really precise, you'd say dogma is one definitive doctrine is two, uh, and authentic uh, or merely authentic doctrine is three. And that is the one that trips everybody up um, because it asks for this religious submission of will and intellect, which, uh, which nobody upon reading that is able to just immediately understand what that means, <laughs> uh, including theologians. So it's an it's a, it's a obscure and technical phrase which is used without explanation. So it's clear to everybody that something is demanded, but it's not clear what. And in that position, uh, Catholics are very uncomfortable and, and um, justifiably so. You want to make sure that you're doing your duty as a, as, a, um, as, a, as a good son of the church, a faithful follower of Christ. And you know that you have to give some positive response to this kind of teaching religious submission of will and intellect all you want to know is do i have to agree with it or not right uh, and and um none of the statements of the magisterium uh have have answered that clearly um they'll, they'll kind of keep repeating this phrase and they might um they might skirt around the edges of, of what's meant by it or what's not but they won't give you a direct answer which does make that difficult, and it does make a lot of pious Catholics, understandably, um, swing towards the kind of uh, maximalist or even hyperpapalist uh, idea. Because if you don't, if you don't know what that term means and what the like extent and limits of that obligation are, you're going to be very cautious about um, questioning anything that any pope or bishop ever says. But it's really important to know that that same obligation you owe to your local bishop. You owe that same obligation to your local bishop. If you lived in Constantinople in the 400s, you owed a religious submission of will and intellect to Nestorius, uh, and he was preaching that Mary is not the mother of God. So, so, so you've, you've got to know uh, that there's, there's limits on that, because we know for sure that individual bishops uh, can and have uh, led people into outright heresy. So whatever that response of religious submission of will and intellect is, uh, you can't take it to an extreme. It's got to have limits, but then people don't know where the limits are, and so they tend to stay as far away from the line as they can. 
which is why they end up getting themselves tied into knots trying to defend uh, or explain or justify um, everything that every pope has ever said, even when they uh, seem to run against each other. Yeah. Um, so we've got a few good questions in the chat. We're going to get to those questions in just a few minutes. Um, and I think I'm gonna we're going to just set aside the liturgy tonight because this is just another big question that we can't even get into yet. Um, so I just want to cover um, one of the things that struck me about reading your your book was that it seemed to me that you basically broke down the basic mark just just trying to boil this down for the the common lay faithful an infallible decree of the pope is clearly intended to definitively resolve a theological question for the entire church that seems to be the basic he's trying to settle an argument he said there's an argument going on and he's going to settle it. And that's why you say Humanae Vitae is clearly infallible because it's clearly intended to resolve definitively. And, and you say the, 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 the John Paul II's ban on female ordination, that's a definitive statement. It's clearly infallible. So would you say that as sort of a, a basic breakdown? Would you, would you summarize it that way just for the common lay faithful? Uh, yes. With one caution, um, there doesn't have to be an actual argument raging at the time in order okay, for the Pope yeah. to do it. Good because point. if you think of the Immaculate Conception or the Assumption of Mary, those dogmas were, were pretty universally accepted in the church prior to the definition. So in both cases, the Pope polled the bishops worldwide, uh, asking for their faith and the faith of their people on these points. And the response was overwhelmingly we and our people believe that these are, in fact, divinely revealed dogmas, uh, which gave the Pope the confidence to go ahead and define it. So, so I wouldn't say that it is, uh, it's not the kind of statement that necessarily does, in fact, settle an argument. It's the kind of statement which is of such a nature that it precludes any future argument. But I think an easier way to kind of summarize the difference, if you just want one thing to sort of look for as you're reading any papal document that's going to flag to you uh, this is infallible it's going to be uh, in some form or another the pope telling you that you have to unconditionally accept the truth of this statement because the the primary difference between the infallible and the non-infallible magisterium in both cases the pope is teaching the faith he's acting as a teacher uh, but in but when he speaks infallibly, he's also acting as a judge. He's laying down the law about the church. So he exercises both these roles. Um, and what's the main difference between a teacher and a judge? Um, I, I am a classroom teacher, so I, so I know how this goes very, very easily. Um, but all of us have experience of classrooms, uh, whether you've taught or learned in them. The role of a teacher is to say, uh, this is what's true. And here are the reasons why. Uh, but when I do that as a teacher, um, I'm not I'm not laying down the law. I'm I'm showing you the truth. I'm leading you to the truth. I'm even telling you that you should believe the truth. Um, but I'm not saying, as a matter of law, you must believe this is true, or you're out. Uh, so the, in, in, if, you, if you think of most of the things that you've read from the Pope, uh, most of it, uh, and heard in, from your bishop and in sermons from your priests, most of the time they're teaching, uh, which is they're telling you this is what we believe, and here are the reasons why, and I hope that you believe it too. Right? That's behaving as a good teacher. But there are a few cases, uh, if you're reading papal documents, where uh, he'll, he'll, he'll do that oftentimes, but then he'll also say, uh, and what I've just said must be accepted by every Catholic. So then he's not just, uh, he's not just appealing to your intellect with here's the truth of the matter that I want you to understand. He's, he's speaking straight to your will. He's saying, uh, you must uh, accept this. Uh, and if you and if you don't, you're harming your communion with the church. 
uh, that is pretty easily recognizable. Now, people want there to be like a, a magic formula, a certain word that he's got to use. Uh, does he have to say the word define? Does he have to threaten excommunication specifically? There's, there's no magic formula. But, but if you can get your head around that, that one distinction of, I'm looking for a way in which the Pope says, not only that this is what we believe, but he speaks to me through the text and he says, you as a Catholic have to believe this. Not this is what we believe, but this is what you must believe. There's an imposition of obligation uh, in the act of solemn judgment. So at Vatican I, the infallible statements of popes and ecumenical councils are referred to as the solemn judgments of the church. Now there's other ways in which the teaching can be infallible if universal. So it's not always necessary for there to be a judgment, but that's the ordinary and universal magisterium, which is a different thing. Uh, it requires uh, universal uh, consensus in the whole church uh, believing and teaching the same thing. Uh, then you can talk about infallibility there as well. But if you're just talking about one pope or one ecumenical council or one document, one statement, you're looking for that uh, moment of judgment. So in Humanae Vitae, it's where Paul VI says, he doesn't just say uh, contraception is bad, you shouldn't use it. He says uh, every form of contraception must be condemned, must be condemned. <clears throat> uh, and in Latin, that's um, damnitur. I mean, it's, it's damned. Uh, so it's, uh, and in Ordinatio Satri Totalis, which you referenced John Paul II on the ordination of women, he says, I declare that the church has no authority to ordain women. If he stopped right there, that's teaching. He says, I'm telling you, the church doesn't have the authority. But then he adds another phrase. He says, and this judgment must be held by all the faithful. Uh, so those are the kinds of phrases where you see the laying down the law about what you must believe in order to be in communion with the church versus uh, the teaching. That, I think that's a really good way to break that down, uh, Dr. Joy, because many of us are parents and we know the difference between, I, I mean, I'm, I'm always, as, as a, you have young children, I have young children, you know, we're constantly having to make a judgment between he said, she said, you know, and we have to make a judgment so that the kids can do something and they can move on with their life because they got to judge something. So, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the fatherhood analogy is perfect and it, and that's not coincidental. I mean, the, the Pope is the Holy Father. He's, uh, that is exactly his role. And, and, and he uses his fatherly authority in the same ways that we do as, as, as human fathers. So if, when your kids are, I don't know, you've got a, a kid who doesn't want to do his homework. Uh, you might sit there for a while with him and say things like, well, you really should do it because you, you want to learn the stuff, you want to get a good grade. Uh, you, you can teach, right? You can say like, yeah. this would be good, this would be good, here's why, and you want to do that as a father. Um, but then there comes a moment where you say, look, we're done talking, right. you're going to do it yeah. or else. <laughs> right, right, right. And the father has both of those roles and a good father does them both and he's clear about the distinction, right? You don't want a father who is, who is, um, who who acts like he's just teaching and not laying down the law, uh, and then kind of um, spins around and gives out some harsh punishment when the kid's not expecting it, right? Right. You, right. you want to be clear about uh, here's when I'm teaching you how to grow in virtue, how to be. Uh, uh, a good, moral, intelligent, virtuous person, etc. Um, but then you've got some things where, nope, you just can't do that, and you lay down the law. Uh, that's the exact same thing that the Pope is doing with the faith, because he, uh, it would be, it would not be good for us spiritually if he were just at every moment laying down the law and hurling excommunications. Maybe a little more than he does wouldn't be a bad thing. Um, but you don't want that to be the only mode of communication from a father is just threats and punishments and laying down the law all the time. Um, so the fact that there is this kind of um, encyclical letter, you know, this, this genre of papal teaching, this apostolic exhortation, um, 
I think maybe we could do with a little bit less of it, but like, it makes sense that there's some of that going on. Mm -hmm. Really, most of that should be going on. That's what your parish priest is supposed to be doing. That's what your local bishop is supposed to be doing. The Pope shouldn't really need to do that for the whole church if the local church is doing its job in the fatherly right. instruction. Um, but when there's something uh, big and, uh, you know, the law has got to be clear, uh, that's the role of the infallible uh, of the infallible teaching. Well, yeah, that's really helpful and something that we can many of us can understand. I want to ask one more question, then I'm going to get to all the chat questions. We got uh, two really good chat questions. If you guys have any other further questions, put them in the chat. Um, and that is on, I think that your second article in your question one, I think, uh, states that the po papal magisterium, the authentic magisterium, but the non-definitive magisterium of the Pope can be in error, but it can it only happens infrequently due to the protection of the church, which I think is a very perfectly nuanced answer. But there are some critics of the trads who seem to believe that if the Pope can ever be in error on these big teachings, then the entire indefectibility of the church is compromised. Uh, yeah. it, it, it seems in my, in my estimation, it seems that people who are taking this view have a very weak faith in Rome to begin with. They, they believe that Rome basically has to be perfect. There's no messy business throughout 2000 years of history. It has to be almost perfect or else I'm going to lose my faith in Roman Catholicism. And I, I mean, I hate to say this, but I mean, if you look into the history of the popes, there's a whole bunch of craziness going on through in the Vatican, you know, for 2000 years. So, you know, if, if your faith is weak on this point and you're scared about the indefectibility of the church, you know, this is this is a serious issue. So but what would you say to those who who claim that, you know, the indefectibility of the church is compromised if the pope can be in error in these big ways? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a really important point. I think that I think the most important thing to see is to go back to the idea that the Pope is not absolutely and simply speaking the same as the church. He's the head of the church. He's the visible head of the church on earth, but he's not the church. <clears throat> the church is the mystical body of Christ, which is composed of all the faithful. Now he has a, an absolutely essential role in that because, uh, because he is the um, locus of unity for all of the members of the church. Uh, which means in order to be in union with the church, you have to be in union with the Pope. Um, but he's not the same thing as the church. And so uh, only some of his actions or statements can be simply um, equated with the church. So if the Pope were to declare ex cathedra, you know, by the authority of the Holy Apostles, Peter and Paul, and by my own authority, I declare it to be a divinely revealed dogma of faith that there are four persons of the Holy Trinity, uh, and if you don't believe it, anathema sit. If he said that, uh, the indefectibility of the church would be destroyed because, uh, uh, because he would not only be straying into heresy himself, he would be imposing it as an obligation of communion with the church that you also go into that heresy. He's, he'd be imposing it on you that you must, in order to be in communion with me, the Pope, you must follow me into my heresy. And if he, uh, if he does that, then, the, then you can't escape, right? Because then either uh, the whole church uh, goes into heresy, which is contrary to the indefectibility uh, of the church, or the whole church goes into schism by uh, withdrawing from submission to the Holy Father, and that also is contrary to the indefectibility of the church. The dogma of papal infallibility is specifically telling us that scenario can't happen. But it's only that scenario that can't happen. There are other scenarios that can happen. So when the Pope says, uh, you know, uh, I, <laughs> yeah, I don't know, what, what was it, John the 22nd? I don't want to pick on any Pope in particular. If a Pope says, um, you know, I believe that everyone goes to heaven in the end, uh, he has strayed into heresy, if he were to say that. But he hasn't pulled the whole church after him if he hasn't tried to impose it as a mandatory belief on everybody else, right? Uh, so he himself would have strayed into heresy by saying something like that. Um, but you and I, in order to be 
uh, in the church uh, are still would still have to believe the dogmas of the faith, and we wouldn't have that conflict of obedience, right? Because we would know we have to believe the true faith. We have to be in communion with the Pope, um, but we can be because he hasn't he hasn't required of us anything that we can't that we can't do. Uh, so we'd say, well, he's made a terrible mistake, um, but he hasn't he hasn't dragged the whole church after him. So if he just teaches something uh, false or heretical, it's very very serious. I mean, I I, uh, I hate to give the impression that it's no big deal. Because it, it does, as a matter of fact, end up causing a lot of people to lose their faith. Um, but it doesn't have to, and it doesn't destroy the indefectibility of the church, because the indefectibility of the church just means that the whole church can't be dragged into error or heresy. It doesn't mean that no part of the church could be dragged into error or heresy. We've seen over 2,000 years uh, whole, whole nations that used to be connected to the church uh, going off into error or heresy. So even if a papal error would pull a, a good number of people away from the true faith, that's not contrary to the indefectibility of the church. Only if he imposes as an absolute obligation on all of us that we have to accept his error, uh, only that would destroy the indefectibility of the church, which is why the dogma of papal infallibility uh, specifically says he's infallible when he defines a doctrine because that d defining is that imposition of authority on the whole church that's what uh, we know is divinely guaranteed because the whole dogma is a deduction from what did our lord promise he promised that the gates of hell would not prevail against the church now he gave peter the keys he said things about binding and loosing like there's a lot in those scriptural texts that we can readily understand as implying papal infallibility but what he clearly taught is the indefectibility of the church. So uh, the dogma of infallibility is, is deduced from the more fundamental doctrine of indefectibility, but you can't deduce, you can't get more out of the conclusion than you have in the premises, right? This is a standard um, rule of logic. You can't get a bigger conclusion uh, than, your, than your starting points. So all you can deduce in terms of infallibility is as uh, is what amount of protection protection is necessary at a minimum to preserve indefectibility? Then we know we're on sure ground, um, and that's all. That's what Vatican I did by just defining the infallibility of the Pope in those uh, sort of precise uh, circumstances where he's teaching definitively. Absolutely. <clears throat> Well, we, we don't have enough time to get into all the questions, but this is one of the best ones from Colin. He talks about what are your thoughts on infallible safety? And I, as I understand Colin to be talking about uh, the Pope can promulgate a universal discipline like the liturgy, for example, or fasting rules or things like that. Um, and it is the opinion of various manualists that there must be a safety regarding these things so it could be an error in some sense but it should be able to be safe uh now he's making reference i think he's making reference to this from thomas pink papal authority and the limits of official theology which was a recent uh uh text by dr pink um can you comment at all on um the idea that a universally promulgated discipline must always be safe uh, is there any sort of level of theological note on that that you would see, Dr. Joy? Yeah, so I think there's there's kind of two sides to this. Um, so to the theological, well, two sides to it first. So this kind of language has been used by theologians and some of the some of the big names in uh, the neo-scholastic theology of the late 19th and early 20th century. I think this comes from Franzel in, in particular, although there's something like it in Cardinal Below. Uh, Sometimes it's used about to speak about disciplines, right, or something like that idea. Um, but it's also used to refer to just doctrinal teaching with the non-infallible note. So, so if the Pope um, simply gives a, a teaching with a low level of authority that, that could in fact be false because it's not infallible, is it necessarily safe to believe it? Um, 
uh, and that's a much more difficult claim. So, so first of all, the theological note, this is, this is an idea that prominent theologians have put forward. I've never seen any kind of um, official endorsement of that position uh, from, uh, from a document to the magisterium. Maybe somebody can find one. Um, but I don't think there's anything like this. So, so you'd be very, very free. Dr. Pink is very, very with, free within his rights to, to simply dispute that that's even a real thing. Um, I think there's a much better argument for it in the case of the disciplines. So, um, because when the Pope uh, legislates a certain uh, discipline, like a certain mode of acting for the whole church, um, this is, again, uh, a, an area of open discussion and free dispute. So you can't get in trouble by defending either side of this. You shouldn't get in trouble. Um, but there does seem to be a, something at least very unfitting about the idea that the Pope could positively command something which would be sinful to do, right? So... <clears throat> at least uh, in, a, in a universal way. Because obviously right, you, can, absolutely. you can personally tell somebody to invade the Kingdom of Naples sure which yeah which he's done plenty of times yeah <laughs> uh, right but to command catholics universally as such you know like uh this is the a law of the church for catholics to abide by generally speaking not simply um a bad decision of a of an individual pope um <clears throat> i mean when when uh the renaissance pope uh gave the order to his to his caterer to buy all the food for the orgies uh it probably you, you know, maybe it would have been okay to say, no, thanks. I'd rather not have anything right. to do with that. Um, but right, when you're speaking about universal legislation, uh, so something like, um, well, I don't know, how controversial do you want to get? Communion in the hand or something like that, right? Right. Um, if uh, I, I am of the opinion that communion in the hand uh, of its own nature presents a grave risk of sacrilege, right? Um, could the Pope have commanded the whole church, you must receive only on the hand? Um, I don't think so. Uh, but he didn't do that, right? So, so if the command is, here's the thing that you all must do, I would be very uncomfortable with thinking that, that he could command you to sin. <clears throat> so I do think there's a kind of infallible safety about following the universal disciplinary commands of the church. But a lot of the controversial things that people argue about on the internet, especially over liturgy, are really not in the nature of commands. They're mostly in the nature of permissions. So, uh, so you, you do not have to think um, the Pope gave permission, for example, for um, uh, girl altar boys. Uh, there's nothing that would make you think there's some kind of um, infallible safety about having girl altar boys, right? Because there's, there's no necessity for it because you're, you're free to use that permission or not as a parish priest, um, which means if you choose to use it, you're, you're kind of acting on your own uh, authority there. You can't... <clears throat> You can't that, that is the, in the divine term. tribunal. That's the technical term, girl altar boys, just so everyone knows. <laughs> the correct term. It is. It is the correct term to use. Always use that term. Thank that you. is how I describe it to my children, <laughs> uh, because then then they're never confused. It's always clear. Yeah, it's uh, it, it never even occurs to ask, why can't I be an altar boy? Because they know that they're <laughs> girls. Uh, so that question doesn't arise. If you call them servers, then, then the question is going to come up. Well, why can't I be a server? And exactly then you've got to have all kinds of conversations. <clears throat> um, so, so infallible safety is a, is a disputed question. Uh, there are some good arguments in favor of holding to an idea like that in terms of the disciplinary legislation, but I would say only in terms of the universal and positive commands, uh, not permissions. Um, and then the infallible safety connected to doctrinal teaching, I think, is on much um, shakier ground. I can't see uh, any real justification for it there. <clears throat> um, because again, the, this category, that third category of teaching that requires the religious submission of will and intellect, um, 
we know that there have just been straight out heresies taught uh, from bishops, and there's at least a good number of popes that have uh, are under serious. Um, there's good reason for thinking taught heresy at different points in the church's history. Uh, so, so it doesn't make sense there to speak about uh, any kind of infallibility, whether of safety or otherwise. Okay, excellent. Uh, here's another. So, just again, so everyone knows, the in idea of infallible safety is a disputed question. So, the theologians yeah. can go <laughs> on either side of that. And so, one of the things I want to try to emphasize in this whole broadcast is that there are many people out there who say on these disputed questions, well, if you don't believe that, you're not a Catholic. And that's not true at all. This is what we're trying to say is that among the academic theologians who are actually more authoritative on this, they're disputing this. So, it's not true that uh, you know we should we should come down so hard against fellow Catholics as many do. Um, yeah, if the, if the best you can quote is is Franzlin or Below uh, or even Bellarmine, God love him, um, you shouldn't assume that you've won the argument simply by quoting an authoritative figure. Those guys have legit credentials, so nobody should take them lightly. They deserve to be quoted and brought up in an argument. But then there still has to be a discussion about the merits of the arguments they put forward. It's not an open shut case as if you're uh, as if you're just quoting scripture or something. Sure. Absolutely. Um, Pedro has a question. Uh, thanks, Pedro. He sent us a donation for this one. Um, can there be a minimalist reading of Octorum Fidei, Mimare Vos and Quo Graviora with regard to condemnations of obscuration and defects in liturgical discipline. Now, if I understand Pedro's question correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, Pedro, in the chat. Uh, I understand you're asking the, 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 there's a, um, a line that's condemned in the Doctorum Fidei, which says that the church cannot, or it's condemning the idea that the church can promulgate defective liturgy. That's what's condemned in some form. Um, is so, Dr. Joy, what are your thoughts on uh, a, a minimalist reading of, of these things? That's going to be hard to answer without looking at the text, and I don't have that one uh, in mind. I have a vague notion of, of what you're talking about, but it would be way too hazardous to dissect something without looking at it carefully. Okay, well, uh, I, I want to point, uh, Pedro, there is a, a treatment of this by Peter Kwasniewski, um, because some say there are, again, trit critics of the trads who say, well, we cannot come along and, and critique the Novus Ordo and say that there's some defect in any way of the Novus Ordo because that goes against Octorum Fidei. But the problem with that argument is that the entire promulgation of the Novus Ordo was predicated on the fact that the, the Latin Mass itself was defective. In fact, the most recent statement, uh, one of the most recent critics of the trads, which was published in Church Life Journal, um, actually said that there was an intrinsic defect in the Latin mass, which caused a defective ecclesiology. So, so that's entirely, you know, if, if you're going to be very strict about this and say, you can't say there's any defect whatsoever with the promulgated liturgy. Well, that's exactly the premise of the Novus Ordo itself. So the fact that there has to be a reform reformation of the liturgy and we need to abolish the prior liturgy is presupposing the fact that the prior liturgy had uh, some defect. So it's, it's sort of this catch 22 that goes both ways there. Um, so I, I think there has to be further distinctions on in what sense are we talking defects? We're not talking defects in terms of validity. Everybody agrees that the Novus Ordo is valid. Everybody agrees. The Latin mass is valid, valid sacraments, no disagreement there. But there has to be some defect on a on a lesser uh, plane of of uh, essentials of the liturgy, if you will. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. So maybe I'll just uh, comment. So so the statement of Octorum Fide, right? Uh, to summarize what you just said, comes to saying that the church cannot promulgate defective, useless, or harmful rites. Now, uh, the right way to read any dogmatic teaching of the church or, or infallible teaching of the church uh, is always going to be um, a minimalist one in the sense that, uh, I don't mean try to make it say as little as you possibly can. I mean, you have to be careful about not making it say more than it does. So 
be cautious not to go further than the text allows. So, so when you say <clears throat> if there are if there are, if there's more than one legitimate interpretation of how those words could be understood, then you can't assume that the that the broader interpretation has been infallibly taught. Does that make sense? So if there's if there's two things that the text could mean, and one is um, a narrower statement, and one is a much broader statement, you would have to admit that it means at least the narrower statement, and so you could not treat that as a disputed question, right? Um, mm -hmm. But whether or not it really meant the broader statement would then be an open question that would need additional clarification. So when you say something like the church cannot promulgate defective, useless, or harmful rights, well, what would it mean to promulgate a defective right? There's a, there's a very narrow reading of that, which would mean, okay, at the very least, it can't promulgate a, a essentially defective right, which would mean like an invalid right. Uh, well, everybody would agree with that. Uh, but you could interpret that to mean something much stronger. The church cannot promulgate a right uh, with any defect whatsoever, as if it's immune to every form of criticism. Uh, well, because you've got those two possible interpretations, uh, you can't assert that one over the other is necessarily the right meaning of that text, which means you have to uh, settle for the, for the narrower interpretation as the undisputable uh, common teaching that we all have to agree with. And then you dispute about the, uh, about the broader meaning or not, which means the conversation doesn't end there, but you have to really dig into what's the context, what are the, um, uh, you know, what, what, is, what is all of the, the surrounding historical context, what are the other things said in the document, and so on and so forth, uh, to try to get at whether something more in-depth is meant. So I, th I think that, um, well, anyway, that's the broad lines on which I would approach a question like that. And the same thing for defective, uh, useless, or harmful. I don't think, uh, well, I, I hope that even most trads would admit that going to the Novus Ordo is not positively harmful. Uh, it, might be, it might be less spiritually nourishing than the Latin Mass. It might be, um, right, it, it might be less rich, it might, uh, but it's not going to um, positively and necessarily do spiritual damage uh, simply by attending. So I think, I think trads could agree uh, pretty easily with a minimalist reading of that kind of text, uh, and then just still engage in the bigger argument around the disputed question of uh, how much deficiency uh, is compatible with uh, liturgical legislation. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, my 6 p.m. Angelus. Um, I, I'm over here in Eastern time, uh, and uh, Dr. Joy, you are, we're all out of time, so once again, um, Pick up disputed questions on papal infallibility um, and uh, buy two. Give one to your priest. Uh, uh, so Christmas is coming. Uh, fill your priest's stocking with this fantastic text from Dr. Joy. So uh, sorry we couldn't get uh, further into further questions, but uh, feel free to comment below. And uh, if I can't any answer any questions, I'll, I'll give these over to Dr. Joy. So Dr. Joy, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Thank you much so much for your good work. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for uh, for having me on. It's a it's a it's a fun conversation to have. It's it's the it's the topic that I never expected would uh, would be my my specialty, so to speak. Uh, I, I never set out to be an expert in papal infallibility, so I'm not quite sure how it happened. Um, uh, I, I dug into these questions when I when Cardinal Ratzinger was the Pope, much more out of uh, just theological curiosity almost just wanting to dig deeper into uh the understanding of the papacy which i which i uh which i love so i have a great devotion to to the catholic church and to the roman see and to saint peter and the institution of the papacy um so but i got i got most of the way through my research i started uh um uh figuring all of these things out at least to my own satisfaction and then pope francis became pope and everybody suddenly became interested in these topics so. <laughs> Uh, happy, happy uh, to get on and chat about my uh, my academic projects uh, anytime. 
Uh, one question is, can we contact Dr. Joy anywhere? Do you have any public or would you like them to contact me first? Um, well, uh, let's see. Uh, you can definitely, let's see, I have so many email addresses. Um, uh, the easiest one that's publicly available is, uh, so I work at St. Ambrose Academy, uh, which you mentioned at the beginning of the show. So if you, if you look up the website of Ambrose Academy uh, in Madison, you'll find me on the faculty page and my email should be in there. You're also welcome to get in touch with, with Timothy. He can put you in touch with me too. Excellent. Okay. St. Ambrose Academy in Madison, Wisconsin. Just look it up, the faculty page there and you can get in contact with Dr. Joy. So, excellent. Well, let, let's uh, end with a Hail Mary and offer it all to Our Lady of Guadalupe on her great feast day. Uh, always asking Our Lady to purify our minds that she who is the seat of wisdom may intercede for us to give us true wisdom that we can, we can deal with these difficult topics of Catholic doctrine with wisdom and with charity to our fellow Catholic brethren. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus is King. <laughs>